Welcome to Willow Tree School, just one of 12,623 rural schools built across Iowa from 1870 to 1900. My name is Sebastian Beeler, and I helped build Willow Tree and became its first teacher in 1883. I invite you to hear the story of not only how Willow Tree came to be, but how the entire network of rural schools started. The story of how Iowa's prairie was settled has long been overlooked, and it's untold by historians that thought Iowa had already been settled by 1870. And I'm here to tell you the real story, to uncover the history of Iowa's farms from where they truly began, and share how it happened from the perspective of someone that lived during this exciting time. My story is unique, yet it echoes the stories of millions of others who came to Iowa in search of religious freedom, owning land and having a better life and settling our great state building a school system that has had a positive, lasting impact on education in Iowa today. The nearly treeless, tall, blue stem prairie grass was a natural barrier that slowed and prevented the settlement of over three quarters of the state of Iowa. Even the Oregon Trail and the Gold Rush Trails to California skirted Iowa to take the Missouri River route west. Clouds of biting insects, lack of surface water, fires, grasshopper plagues, extreme weather, a complete sense of isolation, and the fear of getting lost or separated due to a lack of guideposts and trails in the six to eight foot tall grass were some of the many reasons early pioneers avoided the endless miles of Iowa prairie at all costs. Because of these conditions, only 100,000 people were settled by the Mississippi River and its tributaries when Iowa became a state in 1846. Progressive Iowa leaders knew they needed a plan to attract experienced settlers to Iowa to build farms on the rest of the expansive prairie. To settle the prairie, Iowa first needed control of the land, which was currently inhabited by Native American tribes. In a rather progressive decision, Iowa chose to pay the tribes three to 10 cents for every acre of land, rather than fighting for it. The condition of the sale was that the tribes would leave the state, and by 1853, Iowa's prairie was vacant and ready for settlement. I came to the United States from Germany with my family in 1855 at the age of 10. Germany had been in turmoil for years, embroiled in wars, economic collapses, and social and religious controversies, and my parents wanted a better life for their family. My parents heard of life in America from friends and family who had already immigrated and soon made the decision to move to the other side of the world after months on a crowded and confined ship, my family arrived in New York City and settled near friends in Lake County, Indiana. I was lucky to be able to attend a one-room school where I learned to speak and write English. In 1856, soon after my family's arrival in America, the Iowa legislation put its prairie settlement plan into motion, accepting a federal grant to pay the railroad and sections of land for every mile of track that they laid. Not only would the new railroad build a strong Iowa economy through the transport of people and products, it would fund the future school system with 5% of the railroad and public land sales designated for building schools. Education was important to Iowa from the very beginning, as the state felt that educated Iowans would strengthen democracy. Horace Mann played a vital role in convincing legislators and the public that an educated rural populace was essential for a democracy to run. He specifically reminded politicians they needed educated voters to elect them. So in 1858, Iowa planned a unique, free public school system that would be accessible to all of Iowa's students by building a school within two miles of every home. With easements for roads around every square mile, easy school accessibility was purposefully designed to encourage consistent attendance of all children which had been a huge problem at earlier public schools in other states. With the start of the Civil War in 1861, Iowa's settlement plan was delayed. My family and I were proud to be Americans and felt it was important for America to remain a whole country, one that was free for all people. Like thousands of other young American men, I enlisted in the Union Army at the age of 16 alongside my older brother, John. The conditions during the war were extreme. John died of pneumonia the following year, and I was injured from exposure and spent many months recovering in Army hospitals. Though I never fully recovered my health, I served the Army in Washington, D.C. until the end of the war in 1865, when I returned to Indiana. 
The end of the war meant Iowa's settlement plan was again moving forward. By 1869, the railroad finished laying 2,683 miles of track within and across Iowa, connecting Chicago to Council Bluffs and linking both cities to the Intercontinental Railroad. Ready to sell its accumulated prairie land, which consisted of 13% of Iowa, the railroads joined together and formed the Iowa Railroad Land Company, which created advertising booklets to help sell millions of acres to farmers beginning in 1870. At the same time, Iowa created the State Board of Immigration, which also developed a booklet called Iowa, the Home for Immigrants. They contained information about Iowa to assure immigrants that they were welcome and good land was available. Printed in five languages, this booklet enticed experienced farmers in Europe to bring families and communities to Iowa. Together with the railroads, this ignited the largest private land sale in U.S. history. In order for the settlement of Iowa to succeed, it was the hardest working and experienced settlers that were needed. The advertisements created by Iowa and the railroad companies did not paint a picture of easy living and easy money, which would only attract those who would be unsuccessful. Instead, they wrote of the hard work and determination that was required to succeed. As the railroad advertisement stated in a section entitled, Shall I Go West? If you have ordinary health, determination, self-reliance, energy and ambition, yes. If you have a little money, it will help you start. But if you are willing to work and determined to succeed, you can make your way without much money. But if you suppose you can come west and sit idly down and find the greenbacks rolling themselves into your pockets, you had better not come. If you are young and strong and have no profession or trade, come west and buy some land in some spot of earth you can call your own. Make a man of yourself. You can be a great deal more of a man and just as much of a gentleman seated on a reaper, driving four first-rate horses in a 320-acre wheat field, especially if you are a farmer's boy. Don't be guilty of the supreme folly of going off to the village or city in quest of some employment which you fancy is more genteel than farming. It is not there. And every town and city, east and west, is already overrun with such persons. But start a western farm. And if there is any good in you, it will manifest itself. And if you are good for nothing, it matters not where you are. Before uprooting whole families to move across the country or world to settle in Iowa, a scout was sent to survey the land. It was not uncommon for young men to leave their families to travel alone and find the best land. Once scouts found land they liked, they would write invitations for their family and friends to come. I myself left Indiana with my brother-in-law, Valentine, to scout the Iowa land after seeing advertisements about rich, cheap prairie that would be for sale starting in 1870. We traveled through many counties to find the richest farmland. And finally, in 1871, we selected an unsettled area in Sac County that would later become Richland Township and would eventually have a town called Odebolt. My oldest brother Jacob, Valentine, and I each bought 200 acres of land for $4 an acre with five years to pay. In July of 1871, I wrote an invitation to friends in Indiana to join us in Richland Township. There is still much land here at the same price as ours. It is railroad land, and if you want to buy, according to my idea, you can't do any better anywhere than here. It's as good as we saw anywhere, and you know we would buy no poor land. If you want to come to us, you must come to Fort Dodge, then to Storm Lake, and from there, you can easily find us if you ask for the Booyer Settlement. When you get in the settlement, ask for a man named Willard, and he can tell you where we live. All across the state, from 1870 to 1900, farms were established with families joining their scouts soon after. My story is the same as the million settlers that came to Iowa over those 30 years, turning Iowa into a patchwork of different cultures. Just within our township, we had Swedish Lutheran, Irish Catholic, German Catholic, Scottish and English communities, in addition to our own large German Methodist community. Turning the prairie into farmland was a hard and lengthy process using horses and steel plows, but it was my duty to my family back in Indiana to build them a livable farmstead. 
Valentine and I built a dugout lined with rocks on his land as a temporary home while we broke sod and planted crops to sell so we could purchase and ship lumber to build our barns and houses. By 1876, my wife and children were by my side in our new home, and some of our old neighbors had become our new neighbors. We helped each other make our community a success through every hardship. Valentine, like many others, died of injuries received in an unexpected blizzard. Many children died of diseases and accidents, like three of my children, who died in a diphtheria outbreak. My sister died in childbirth, like so many women did. Small towns developed to support us farmers as we worked to quadruple Iowa's tilled land to 35.5 million acres, the highest it would ever be. The state was finally settled with 2.2 million residents by 1900. The plan had worked with spectacular speed and success, yet it was a silent happening in a distant prairie for non-rural Iowans. Accomplishments came without fanfare, battles, or headlines. The sudden increasing number of children settling with their families in Iowa sparked the real development of the public school system designed by the state in 1858. My neighbors began a farm school in 1876 so our children could be educated until the public rural school was built. We had to wait until 1879 for the state to finish appointing a superintendent of schools for each county, who were each charged with organizing and authorizing the local school boards so we farmers could build our one-room schools. Finally, in 1883, Willow Tree was ready to open on an acre of land I gave to the school district. We were so proud of our school, built with Victorian influence like so many other schools at the time. The state officially named it Richland Township Number One School, but the locals forever called it Willow Tree School, where I proudly served as the first teacher. In total, 12,623 one-room schools were built across the state. Each was a part of the public school system, not private, religious, or standalone. Because the system was free and meant to educate all children without exception, it was a first for public education. Each school was operated through a school board of farmers which was tasked with hiring teachers, maintaining the structure and grounds, and working with the county superintendent of schools. In each Iowa rural school, the classroom model was the same. The school consisted of a single ungraded classroom in which the statewide course of study for grades first through eighth were taught by one teacher. Before receiving a teaching certificate, a teacher was required to be 18 years of age and had to pass a certification exam. While there was a statewide course of study, there were no state-required textbooks. These decisions were made by the local school boards. The use of rural schools wasn't limited to educating the youth. They were also used as community social centers for annual 4th of July picnics, evening lyceums for adult social discourse and declamation, pie and ice cream socials, and classes for adults. Rural schools were physically located at the center of each school area, and by serving multiple purposes, they anchored rural settlements, becoming the center of our communities in a symbolic sense as well. It took hardworking settlers and our state's value of education to create Willow Tree School in the Iowa you live in today. Thank you for listening to my story. You have just heard about the early years from Mr. Beeler. He suffered a lifetime with his war injuries and finally died at the age of 54 in 1899. I would now like to tell you about the successes and challenges of the Iowa Rural School System. Hello, my name is P.A. Lauterbach. I was the first elected superintendent of schools of Sac County in 1919 and was re-elected until I retired in 1959. I had a reputation that many students and teachers feared me, yet I know they respected me for moving the 100 plus rural schools under my charge towards excellence. On my unannounced semester visits to each school, I would critique the classroom operation listen to concerns, inspect the school structures, and audit required records for the continuity of each student's progress in completing the Iowa course of study. By the 1900s, the state wanted improved structures and modernized curriculum. Beginning in 1912, Iowa State Teachers College, 
now called UNI, implemented normal school training courses in every high school in Iowa to prepare rural teachers. By 1952, a two-year college degree was required to teach, and by 1960, a four-year degree was needed. Iowa rural schools were successful for many reasons. We taught our students citizenship and civics and connected these concepts to social behavior. We also taught skills to ensure the learning that took place inside the classroom also related to life. Music was learned as a celebration of community, while mastering sewing also meant mastering persistence and patience. Our teaching methods are another reason for the success of our schools. For example, recitation was designed for an ungraded classroom. Students were grouped according to their competency in each subject area, whether beginning, intermediate, or advanced. Groups rotated every 10 to 15 minutes to a bench in the front of the classroom where a teacher would question, test, and grade each student's work. The rest of the students had seat work assigned and were expected to remain quiet. However, all rural students remember eavesdropping and listening to other students. Students always had to explain how they solved a math problem before giving an answer. If you heard eighth grade math for eight years, how could you not learn it? Students in our rural schools learn at their own pace, testing at each level before advancing and passing an eighth grade exam before entering high school. This model for learning meant the education of the individual student was not hindered by the needs of another student's education. Gifted students were able to complete their education in fewer years, while struggling students were allowed the time they needed to understand their coursework. The school system across Iowa was arguably the best ever, and Iowa history offers plenty of evidence. After federal free rural mail delivery was established in 1896, a 14-year study by the U.S. Postal Service, using the number of mail reading materials and the number of registered voters, found Iowa to be the most literate state at 97.9%. In 1935, Iowa began the Iowa Every Pupil Tests, later known as the Iowa Basic Skills Test at a time when the majority of Iowa students were still in rural schools. This test was used across the nation to track student academic progress, and Iowa scores were in the top three states for the rest of the century. By 1960, when most rural schools closed, Iowa still had the highest literacy rate of 99.3%. While the success of Iowa's rural schools was quite evident, challenges to the rural school system existed from the very beginning. Many non-rural educators never valued or understood rural life. How could a one-room, one-teacher school with no electricity or plumbing be academically comparable to a modern town school? And even though the cost per rural student was always lower than that of a town student, some felt tax dollars were better spent on town schools. The dynamics of the families served by rural schools had changed to the point that, by the mid-1900s, there were no longer enough children to fill a school every four square miles. The state always required a minimum of 10 students to stay open and families had gotten smaller while farms had gotten larger. After World War II, roads and buses were greatly improved so farm children could be reliably transported into town. Challengers of the rural school system finally convinced the public that larger town schools meant a better education and farmers agreed that digging a well and installing indoor toilets in an 1800s built one-room school was too costly. By the 1950s, most farmhouses had electricity and indoor plumbing, so outhouses were no longer socially acceptable in school, even in rural areas. In 1953, the community school district was created by the state, placing rural schools within the boundary of a town district 
and giving local districts the authority to close rural schools. By 1966, there were no public rural schools operating in Iowa. Iowa rural schools and the way they came about had a lasting effect on our state and they deserve to be remembered. Our state's story of changing prairie into farms and creating a great education system that anchored settlement in Iowa is truly unique. The schools educated and helped farm children have a better life and become good citizens. One-room schools continued to have an impact on education for generations after they closed. Thousands of teachers became mothers and grandmothers, instilling in their children and grandchildren the importance of an education and the need to be responsible citizens. The result is a Midwestern rural culture that stresses self-reliance, yet the responsibility to help others demonstrates the importance of educating everyone for the sake of democracy and celebrates and defends the American freedoms they cherish. On the 2004 Iowa State Quarter, it says our state's foundation is education. And it was the one-room schools that were the building blocks of this foundation. Please enjoy stepping back in time to 1883 to experience a one-room school in Iowa.